Indy 500 Films presents the legends of the Brickyard. While the KG veterans such as Foyd, Unser, Andretti, and Rutherford could still be counted on for wheel-to-wheel -wheel battles, the 80s ushered in a new era of drivers who, to most outsiders, it seemed, virtually made names for themselves overnight. Hello, everyone. I'm Larry Newber. And I'm Bob Jenkins. Like the Unzers the year before, 1984 marked the first year Mario Andretti competed against his son, Michael, here at Indianapolis. Michael was one of six rookies who proved to be the most competitive Tyros ever. But the veterans weren't just sitting back on their heels. With Tom Sneva leading the way, the speed barriers continued to fall. Seven years after breaking 200, he cruised past 210. And now, just three years later, Sneva and others are pushing to break 220. And for the first time in history, the entire field averaged over 200 miles an hour. So be prepared for some fast action as we bring you the 1984 Indianapolis 500. This is the way it always begins men, race cars, and the famous 75-year-old Indiana Oval. It is, of course, an annual test of the driver's expertise behind the wheel of a 200-mile-an-hour racer. But more than that, it is a proving ground for designers and car builders to see if automotive technology advances made in the past year will give their driver that extra ounce of advantage he needs to win. In this first week of practice in early May, new concepts and innovations are soon proven or discarded. The 200 mile an hour lap is the target for all drivers. Beyond that is a special high speed world open only to the most skilled and daring. from their mistakes. Others are concerned with the fine tuning of a new machine. It is a great open air speed laboratory where paper designs are transmitted into hard, fast moving realities. The speeds climb steadily upward until the fastest 33 cars out of a record 117 entries have been selected to start the 1984 Indianapolis 500. At a field average of 203.686 miles an hour, they take the green flag at 200. The selection process begins. It is Saturday, May 12th, and 1979 500 winner Rick Mears is on the track. His speed climbs to a four-lap average of 207.847 miles an hour. It could be fast enough to earn him the coveted pole starting position. A rookie with a familiar name is on the track. Michael Andretti of Nazareth, Pennsylvania, becomes the second man in Indianapolis 500 history to race against his father. His speed is way up front with 207.805. Now, dear old dad is trying for the pole, but on his fourth and last qualifying lap, the engine dies, and Mario coasts past the checkered flag. He can't believe that this has happened to him. His average is 207.467. He will start the race behind Michael. The checkered flag is out for three-time winner Al Unser Sr. A very consistent 204.441 mile an hour average earns him the pole spot of the fourth row. Now, the man who visited Victory Circle last year, Tom Sneva of Paradise Valley, Arizona, boosts the pole-winning speed to a new track record of 210.029 miles an hour. When he first broke the 200-mile-an-hour barrier back in 1977, they said that was the limit. Well, now it's 10 miles an hour faster. Jose Garza, over 200. Gordon Johncock, two-time winner, is in now with 207.545. Tail Bobby, last year's pool sensation, 203.6. Al 
Hollinser Jr., 203.404, just a little slower than Dad. Howdy Holmes, Ann Arbor, Michigan, claims the second spot with 207.977. Mears moves to the outside. Sneva stays in place. It looks like that's the front row. Steve Chassie is next. He tried hard to save it, but crashed the wall and rode it to a stop in turn four. Roberto Guerrero from Colombia is a rookie on his second attempt. He boosts his average to 205.717 miles an hour. Now, A.J. Foyt. This will be his 27th consecutive 500, a record unequaled in Speedway history. 203.860 is close to the field average. He's in the race. The littlest spectator probably couldn't care less how fast the cars go. It's more than speed that brings people out to the 500. We ask Ann Jeanette Hutchins why she was there. I don't care how fast they're going. I just come to see the gorgeous drivers. And Mary Tanner? Well, there's my brother, Al Anser, and there's my dad, Al Anser. I guess that's a good reason to come out. Well, this 1919 Packard was around when Mary's grandfather, Jerry Unzer, was racing up Pikes Peak. They found it rusty, half buried in a Midwest field. It took three years to restore, and now the Wingfoot Express makes a nostalgic visit back to the Speedway. But nostalgia was not on the minds of unqualified drivers who wanted to claim one of the few remaining starting positions. For some of them, disaster was waiting. winner, Johnny Rutherford, has exhausted the three chances to qualify allowed for each entry. It looked like he would sit on the sidelines until A.J. Foyt and his partner, Jim Gilmore, purchased Al Unzer Jr.'s backup car and gave Johnny another chance. On the track, with virtually no practice time, he takes his last shot. The car smokes mysteriously, but he decides to ride it out for four laps. 102 miles an hour. No record, but Rutherford is in the 68th Indianapolis 500. Rutherford was part of a unique effort at Indianapolis that year. For the first time ever, two drivers with at least three 500 victories each were members of the same team. A third member was perennial Foyt teammate George Snyder. Daybreak. The magic moment arrives. There is a special blessing for the racers. Then, organized confusion. This is the time they have been preparing for. Each man will perform his assigned task in synchronization with others to produce a symphony of color, excitement, drama, and a moment of supreme victory.
the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Mrs. Mary F. Hallman. Gentlemen, start your engines. continues for the first 25 laps with racing speeds right at 200 miles an hour. Mears can see Sneva in his rear view mirror most of the way. Howdy Holmes makes an early stop in the 15th lap with electrical problems. This eight minute and 40 second delay effectively removes him from competition. start of the 26th lap. Rick Mears is in for service. 18 seconds for three tires and a load of fuel. A severe accident three months later brought Mears' season to a premature end. But despite serious injuries to both feet, which greatly limited his mobility, he did run a limited schedule the following year, including here at Indianapolis. Now, Tom Sneva is in. Bone dry. He settles for a full load of fuel and a restart in 22 seconds. shuffled around. Mario Andretti has the front spot from the 26th to the 47th lap. It's Spike Gelhausen sideways in the south short shoot. He stops in turn two without touching anything, but for a moment, he represents a hazard to the high-speed field. Everyone pits. Generally, a pit stop every 25 laps is normal, and the Gelhausen spin came at the 48th lap. The oldest driver, Dick Simon, pleads with his mechanic to keep him going. The 
green flag again. Sneva leads, then Mears. It's Pat Bedard in the North Short Shoot. His car is reduced to a pile of disconnected junk and a miracle. Bedard survives with minor injuries. It is a reliable test of the new safe car design. Green again, Teo Fabi Lee. Then Danny Angaius. Fabi again. Then Al Unser Jr. And then Sneeper. Bobby comes in with ignition problems, out of the race. At the entrance to the pit, Gordon Johncock spins through, hits the inside wall, bounces back, and comes to a rest on the inside of the track wall. He has a broken foot and a big frustration. Johnny Rutherford and his new car are out with an engine failure. Allinger Jr. joins the growing parade of sideline drivers. His car has a broken water line. Andretti gets the signal to come in for service. Ahead of him on the pit driveway are Rick Mears and Jose Garza. Unable to pass, Andretti rams Garza and damages his nose cone and right front wing. Too much damage to continue. Andretti climbs out. After 15 years, he's still looking for his second Indianapolis win. Mears leads the race as the green flag comes out again. Sneva pits almost immediately. At first, it looked like a routine stop, and that momentarily he would go back to battle Rick Mears down to the finish line. But the fueling is off. The engine is stopped, and he climbs out. His car has a broken CV joint, part of the suspension system. If it had failed at high speed, there would have been a very dramatic accident. As it is, Tom Sneva will challenge Rick Mears another day. Continues to lead, running close to 200 miles an hour. Roberto Guerrero is second. Al Unser Sr. is third. A.J. Boyd is sixth. The laps tick away as Mears gets closer and closer to his winning goal. There's the white flag. One lap to go. Traditionally the longest lap of the race because suddenly the driver has time to think about all the things that can go wrong. Roger Penske and his crew worry Rick on around the track and down to the checkered flag. And there it is. Rick Mears of Bakersfield, California is a two-time Indianapolis 500 winner. Three hours, three minutes, and 21 seconds, Rick Mears drove 500 miles. Along the way, he made eight stops for service, which took a total of one minute and 54 seconds. This time was just about the difference between Mears and second place finisher Roberto Guerrero. It is easy to ignore the service crews. They perform their tasks in a quiet anonymity, with a sureness of purpose and a paucity of waste movement. They are the hidden heroes of every winning effort. And now, they bask in the reflected glory which Rick Mears has earned on his second ride into Indianapolis 500 racing history. His car owner, Roger Penske, has been here before. But this win is very special to him because it has been five years in the making. Other wins on other tracks. They look great in the record books, but no speed event anywhere brings with it the prestige of this very special classic on the famous Indiana Oval. Sr. gets a welcome home. That's a tired man, but he's still looking for his fourth big win.
By winning for the second time in six years, Mears drastically increased his chances of winning here again. Of the previous 11 two-time winners, seven have gone on to claim a third victory. Hey. The day after the race, Rick Mears poses for the winner's portrait. The other drivers are getting ready to leave, but they all have plans for winning the 500 next year. And the old Speedway goes back to being what it's always been, a home for birds, chipmunks, squirrels, and a fat muskrat that lives in the stream at the south end of the track. It's a nice, quiet place to live and raise a family. Or it will be, just as soon as A.J. Foyt leaves for his next green flag at 200. Mears' second win in six years also continued an incredible streak for car owner Roger Penske. Since Mears' first win in 79, Penske cars had placed first or second every year except 1980. And that year, his highest finisher was a disappointing fifth. Bob, speaking of streaks, Ricky Roberto Guerrero started his own streak in 84. In his first four 500s, he never finished lower than fourth. His second place finish this year, despite an incident during a caution and spinning later, earned him co-rookie honors with... Michael Andretti, who plays fifth. Ironically, his father won the same honor in 1965, and they remain the only father and son to win that honor at Indy. Along with Guerrero and Andretti, IMSA's winningest driver, Al Hobart, placed fourth in his only 500 appearance as a driver, making 1984 the first year three rookies finished in the top five. I'm Larry Newber. And I'm Bob Jenkins. By the way, one final dubious distinction goes to Chris Neifel. He was the only driver in 84 and the last driver ever to qualify slower than 200. That wraps up another Indianapolis 500 in 1984. Be with us again for another Legends of the Brickyard. Mark Messier and Wayne Gretzky take to the ice against Martin Brodeur and Doug Gilmore. The Rangers and Devils tonight. Now the 1980 Indy 500 is next on...